Hello, welcome to The Perspective. Uh, I'm your host, Pimanta Swastoyo. And today we have uh, this guest from Singapore, Germany or where, wherever you are from. <laughs> uh, Rainer Heufer, he's from the, he's the co-founder of the Center of Indonesian Policy Studies. That's welcome right. to The Perspective. Thank you very much. So you're a co-founder. Who's, co Who's the other one? My partner in this center is Ms. Saida Sakwan. She used to be a member of parliament for PKB two PKB. periods, PKB two, right. per two periods ago. Yeah. And right now she is the deputy chairperson of the KPPU here in Jakarta. KPPU. KPPU, the Commission for the Protection so, of the So this foundation must be non-profit then? This is non-profit, <laughs> absolutely. Non-profit, non-partisan. It's also not a PKB exercise. This okay. is non-partisan. The name Center for Indonesian Policy Studies. Uh, what is it actually? What does it do? Tell we, me. <laughs> <laughs> we have a few aims. One is clearly to formulate proposals for the decision makers in Indonesia right. to adjust their policies. Hold on. Which decision makers decision are you talking makers about? I'm talking, yes, I'm talking about decision makers in the legislative branch and in right. the executive branch of government. Means uh, local governments as well as central government DPA, officials DPA as well as, as, well as the parliament and also local parliaments. That's right. right. I've been working in the past with political parties here mm -hmm. in Indonesia. I have got to know many politicians in the country. Yeah. Many of them are open to advice and to ideas. Oh, really? um, but uh, I felt together with Ibu Ida, we felt there is a lack of uh, advice that is formulated in a way that politicians feel they can actually put it into practice. In their language, basically. In their language, basically, that's right. And, and, and when you say policy, policies in what? Focus probably on economic policies, right. but uh, economic policies, if you take it in a broader way, it'll affect society, it'll inf affect environment. I could give you a couple of examples. How later, 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 later. <laughs> how economic policy would affect right. all aspects of life actually here in Indonesia. So basically you, you take economy as the core subject and then y you also see the context. That's right. right. That's, that's a Social context. And so it w when was it founded, actually? This we are in the process of registering right now, <laughs> so it's brand new. We have uh, already launched a few research projects. Right. And we have also launched our communication efforts. Um, but the actual legal registration is going to happen in a little while. A, a question that comes when, when you say non-profit, you're not raising your own money. Where does the funding come from? We are going into fundraising. We are asking ah, okay. networks of other think tanks. So it's crowdsourcing, maybe. basically. It's crowdsourcing. It's asking philanthropists to give right. us some support um, on project basis, usually. We're trying not to ask our, cl our clients, meaning we're not trying to ask the politicians or, or anybody to fund right, us. Right, right. It we would be we like to separate the sources from the It would be, the a, what group. is it? The conflict of it interest. might also smell a little funny when right. you come to political advice. Right. That's right. We try to separate source from destination. And, and when you say source, uh, Indonesia, abroad? At the beginning, mostly abroad. abroad. Um, but hopefully, we'll be able to also convince a couple of philanthropists in Indonesia, which mm -hmm. there are, of course, yeah, um, yeah. to also support this, uh, this institute. Sure, sure. Uh, when you say, I mean, Indonesia, why the choice of Indonesia, for example? I mean, like, I personally have been working in a couple of countries in the region, in Thailand, Malaysia, Philippines, Vietnam. And to me, Indonesia is the country that... The mysterious country. The <laughs> Some people on, call sorry. it the impossible country. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Uh, it's because Indonesia embarks on so many reforms at the moment yeah. in all aspects, on the judicial side, economic, social, etc. Uh, Indonesia is the probably best functioning democracy in this region here. Mm -mm. And no, no, correct me. <laughs> and therefore, we believe here is a great uh, point where we can have the biggest leverage for our ideas. And right. that's why we started this in Indonesia. And when you say our ideas? Our ideas means SCIPS. Now we're talking a little bit about where we're coming from. We're trying to take people seriously in a nutshell. That right. means we're not thinking along the lines of create a law and then go out and educate the people right. how to right. understand it, but rather take the people as rational decision makers, farmers, workers, people, just take them as rational decision makers and take politics as the way of setting the right incentives. So what they do will serve the public interest as well, generate wealth, overcome poverty, etc. So basically this is it's, 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 it's advising how you take decision or advising 
it's what? more like a it's more like a yardstick by which we measure existing policies where we say ah, do right. they actually empower people to take care of themselves right. Right. only if they do this we will have the possibility that Indonesian development will accelerate right. and also for example to protect the environment here I give you an example now if you don't yeah. mind go ahead we're talking about a big amount of deforestation in Indonesia. Yeah. We have huge problems. A lot of countries are coming in and advising right. Indonesia what could be done, what not. But the problem is that nobody really thinks about the actual people on the ground, those who actually cut down those the trees, trees for their purposes. Why are they doing it? Sometimes they do it out of the incentive system that exists. Yeah, they right. take the trees because they're worth more. They take the land because they need it for their agriculture, right. etc. So is there a solution? that will give them the incentive to protect the environment instead of just banning the logging or telling them not to do it. And I think there are ways to do this that take Basically assuring that any policy you should take actually are, are sustainable. Are sustain sense. Exactly. Give the people their property right, for example. Right. Let them manage the forest instead of the government owning the forest and, and then asking them. people and telling people exactly what to do. That's right. I just came back from central Java, right. where I heard about a case where villagers have complained to the local government that they are afraid that the Hutan Negara, the state forest, will be cut down by the government agency. And they protested and they said, please protect the forest. We need it because we are afraid of landslides, water, yeah. flooding, etc. Now it's a conflict between the society and the government. Mm. It would be much better if the society would manage the forest sustainably owning it or at least having the right to manage it mm -hmm. so that they can take care of their own forest. Give some of the benefits, benefits to the government but keep some of the benefits for themselves. We have these models in other countries and it does work. I'm talking about uh, other countries like uh, this, this model of center for policy studies. Yeah. Uh, does it mirror some, something somewhere else? We're collecting examples from all over the world actually. Right. In this case of uh, property rights and deforestation, we're looking at uh, Niger in Africa. Niger, yeah. they, would, they did not give property rights of the ground to mm -hmm. the people, but what they did was they actually gave the rights to own the trees. Oh. So they avoided that problem by letting people own the trees. And yeah, has that, that has worked. Has worked a lot, okay. uh, giving them the incentive to grow more trees. Okay, fortunately we have to break, <laughs> so please stay with us, we will be back. Welcome back. Yeah, still watching Perspective, and we're talking to Rainer Hofer from Indonesian Policy Study or Center for Indonesian Policy <laughs> Studies. Uh, back to your 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 your, uh, your example there, where yeah, about Niger, for example. Uh, Indonesia is a is a country. I mean, it's very difficult to define it. Uh, how can examples from abroad be actually uh, applied here? Is it is it is it selectively, is it, or the principle only? It would be to get a perspective. Uh, it's just to see whether there is something of value that can be adapted to uh, the Indonesian adapted context. Adapted is being the key word. Absolutely, it has to right. be adapted. And there are different examples. There are examples from Germany, the forest management that I just managed, is, uh, that I mentioned is being used in Germany successfully. In Niger, you have this other example of ownership of trees. Mm -hmm. You have different models mm -hmm. in different parts of the world. And it is important for decision makers here to see how this works, but not in a lengthy academic analysis, yeah, but yeah, rather yeah. In, in a language on, they, they understand. In hands-on language and clear recommendations what could be done here. Yeah, right. When I say, when I hear the word language they understand, what is the language they understand? Is no. it in terms of benefits, in terms of profit, in terms of what? No, I think the language is basically a clear-cut recommendation. What can be done in practical terms? What regulation needs to be changed? What kind of practice needs to be adjusted? Uh, uh, so, clear, so it's a very clear guidance. Clear basically. guidance, which they can adopt or not. It right. has to be a they have no time to, to think through 10 different options. It has right. to be a clear recommendation, which can be taken into consideration or not. I think that's the key, the key. of the language yeah. that we want to use. Uh, 
Also, I don't know, you, you're still recent, basically, but in your experience, for example, when you see the decision makers in the region, do they speak the same language, for example? Yes. In terms is. of, yeah? It is the same. Like. When you think about political decision makers, they basically have two motives. One is, of course, the opportunistic motive that mm. they look for their own uh, welfare, standing and, <laughs> and welfare. Um, and here, symbolism becomes very important. So the policies are then, in that case, are driven by what symbolic value do they have for me as a politician. All right. So either you want to portray yourself as protecting the your clientele yeah. uh, and uh, maybe the farmers or the workers, or it depends where you're coming from. Um, but on the other hand, there are also, of course, there's also the other motive of actually creating change and doing good for society. So it's both. Mm -hmm. When it comes closer to elections, the symbolism becomes more important, right. etc. Right. So now we need, when we address those target audiences, we need to keep both motives in right. mind. We need to tell them the benefits, the symbolic benefits, as well as the factual, factual benefits, benefits at the same time. That these are the two things, but there is an additional one, and I think that is important also relating to the particular perspective of oh. uh, our Center for Indonesian Policy Studies. Mm -hmm. And that is that uh, goes back to an economist from the 19th century. He once wrote an article a good economist is the one who sees the visible effects of policies, but also those that are not yet to be seen. Those right. that the consequences of your of your action. The right. bad economist, he said, is the one who only looks at immediate visible, visible yeah. effects. We're trying to be the good economist who look at both right. the visible effects and the foresee unforeseen at the moment. And uh, this is something where I feel Indonesia needs help. in terms of what oh, okay uh, proposals that take into consideration the, the long effects. term effect, something like that. Like an effect that I just saw in Central Java was an effect on a, of a policy in, on the national level right. to restrict or even ban the import of potatoes. Right. This leads to a rise in the potato prices right. in Indonesia, which makes farmers grow potatoes. The problem is, and I just visited the Dieng Plateau in uh, central Java, they have a huge problem with land degradation, soil degradation, oh, because of because the crop, of potato because farming. of the potato, yeah. And the farmers wouldn't give up the potatoes because, because this is the most lucrative right. thing to do for them. So it's a rational right. decision making on their side. You can go and train and educate them for a long time. They wouldn't because yeah. the profit, the benefit is, is clear, for is them. in the potato. Right. So here is a policy that is supposedly giving the visible advantage of growing farmers, the farmers, yeah. etc. But what it does actually it ruins the environment of the Dien, Dien Plateau severely. It's a, it's a huge right. problem over there. It is really damaging potato in that sense? It, there it is really a huge problem, it is, because the uh, potato farmers have changed their um, agricultural methods to adjust to the land degradation, right. so it becomes more and more Dependent, on dependent and the erosion means. is getting stronger and stronger, so you have more landslides, you have more flooding. Ah, uh, right. People die, actually, because of this. It's a serious situation in the Dien Plateau. Right. I will talk again about this, this, this interesting project in Dieng uh, after the break. Uh, we will return. <laughs> Welcome back. You're still watching Perspective, and we're still talking to Rainer Häufer from the Center for Indonesian <laughs> Policy Studies. God, I keep <laughs> forgetting this thing. Um, going back to this uh, to this project in Wonosobo, I'm interested because it's a uh, it's a known fact that yeah, in Wonosobo you go everywhere is potato field, and uh, it's a uh, it's a livelihood of the. So, in that case, what did you do, for example? Did you did you did you write a paper or did you hold a seminar? What it, what was? I had a long discussion with the Kabupaten government over right. there, right. and we are discussing at the moment what could be done to actually approach the the problem over there. The so they're conscious that they are very. The government is, is conscious that this is a huge problem. That's right. right. They have identified this as the key problem actually, right. and now the question is how can we make farmers change their attitude so that they grow something that that maintains the soil that reduces the risk of landslides ideally forestation but 
mm. wood and timber takes a long time to grow, so the immediate benefit is not visible to the farmers, understandably. Or maybe a regulation to demand them to, to, to plant like alternative crop at per periodic. Yeah. You know, alternate between potato and whatever, I don't know. Yeah. What. But if you have the actual benefit, the profit on the side of the potato, the farmers are very reluctant to do it. You can order them to do it. You can always have tomorrow you have them demonstrating at the doorstep of the gov <laughs> of the government. <laughs> if you can ban if you can ban imports, you can certainly ban planting at some points, no? You can do that, but then you run the risk of poverty. Right. Because these people are actually living on a self subsist subsistence level oh, and right. so this is a risky right. move to take. They wouldn't do that over there. I was, I, I was also interested, you told me about this before when we were talking off camera, but uh, that this, this potato beside degrading, for example, that the soil is also degrading the, the, the cohesiveness of the society, the, that's the right. Gotong Royong spirit that we have. Yeah, that's right. Um, it kind of like comes from the big policy making in the, on the national level, where mm. you talk about food self-sufficiency. Sufficiency. I heard that yesterday food, too. <laughs> food self-sufficiency has it pits for. <laughs> means it does actually, yeah, it says to the people we want to only rely on ourselves. Right. We don't want to rely on others. Right. Fight for yourself. Right. Food security, on the other hand, is the better concept, right. so to speak, where you say everybody should have access, physical and economic, to sufficient amount of good food. Good food, yeah. But food self-sufficiency means let's not trust the others. And rely let's try to do it on our own. Exactly. And that trickles down from the national level all the way down to the households. Right. Who then are told, you will take care of Indonesia, you have to do it on your own. Mm. But then what you see is that they are actually trying to survive with this potato farming, which is mm. very, very difficult. It gives mm. them very little money. So what they do is, for example, they, they tap into the lakes to get the water for the irrigation, but they don't do it together anymore. Everybody has their own little water so pipe. So it's a very individualistic uh, Highly individualistic. Um, and here is the typical problem that you have, that this kind of policy making makes people care about themselves right. first before they care about others. Nobody thinks about an irrigation system for the village anymore. Right. You have a mash of different little it's pipes. Me, it's me, you, it's me, you. We had the right. same effect when the conditional cash transfers were introduced by the previous government. Mm -hmm. What is that? You s there were these uh, BOS oh, and okay. the payments right, directly right, right, to right, the household. Right, 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 right. In a way, circumventing certain bureaucracies, which made sense. But the problem was now that people were competing for those funds. Who is registered as particularly poor would get this? Ah, is my neighbor getting right. it? Why am I not getting it? Right, if right, my neighbor right. gets it, why should I help him next time? Because right. he gets money from the government, but right. I don't. So it has, a mi uh, has an influence on the mindset. And the government over there in Wonosoba, they were particularly complaining about that mindset. They ah. go and they ask the villagers, let us sit and think what you can do alternatively to potatoes, do right. something else, what could we do? Let's think about it. They are not willing to engage because they are waiting for the different ministry officials coming from Jakarta, handing them out certain things. Right. They know that a certain part of the year, the Ministry of Forestry will come with seedlings and money so, so that they, they grow ah, trees. Okay. So they just wait for that. So it kills basically the local initiatives. A year later, if the villagers have not grown those trees with the money that they received and the seedlings, the government has no sanctioning mechanism. They I hand see. out more money and more seedlings. So the incentive is not to do anything and wait for the handouts. And this is just one ministry. The others right. come as well. And the local government says, why are they not coordinating with us? Right. We're trying to grow something locally. Right, right. Right. But it's, it, 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 it impacts the mindset in a negative way. But it does show how complex things are regarding a policy. How Things are extremely complex here and you need to be very careful not to set the wrong incentives. Yeah, sure. And look at the sugar policy. It's the same coming from the self-sufficiency program. Ah. You want to help the sugarcane farmers in Indonesia. That's a noble cause. So we're talking about symbolic yeah. policies. Yeah. But at the moment, Sugar prices in the world market mm. are going down going tremendously. Down. Right. They have halved basically recently. Right. This does not come across into Indonesia because there is a so severe okay. restriction on sugar right. imports. Right. So the consumer pays more. So basically, it's always the net consumer who pays the price. And since poor households consume much more food than rich households, 
they are affected they are the, the most. So the poorer households are the ones that suffer from the food self-sufficiency okay. program. That needs to be. We have to break again. Understood. Sorry. Uh, please stay with us. We will be back. Welcome back. You're still with Perspective, uh, and we're still talking to the co-founder of the Center for Indonesian Policies yeah, you got it right. <laughs> Studies, <laughs> Rainer Hofer. Uh, Rainer, uh, when you latch on a policy, a study, what what do you see first? Is it is it the location? Is it the subject? Is it what what makes you decide? Oh, I'll take up this case, and I'll I sort of like. Peel it. I guess I see it from the perspective of whether we are able to actually get, uh, come up with a suggestion. Solution. Is it a practical thing that we can actually suggest? If not, if it's too complex or if the solution is so blur, right. then I think that we won't step into it. So that means but that you look, you look at a lot of problems and you actually do a study on each problem first before actually deciding to develop it. That's right. And also whether the problem affects the people a lot or not. It depends also ah. on that. For example, we are doing another study on the protection of migrant workers. Right. The TKI, the people who go abroad to earn a living, is important yeah, in yeah. Indonesia. Now, there are certain policymakers who suggest to protect those migrant workers by saying, let's not let them go to certain countries. All right. There are people saying we should not let them go to the Middle East, all right, all right. for example. All right. um, well, noble cause to protect these workers. But, but there's no alternative. Fact, from the Middle East, every year, the migrant workers bring back over two billion US dollars to Indonesia. Just from the Middle A East year? alone, every year, over two billion US and dollars. And that's how many people? Contribution of how many people? That's approximately. Every, every year, approximately 200,000 go just to the Middle East alone. Right. And right. they bring right. about that money home. And this money does not go to Jakarta or anywhere. Right. This right. money right. goes they straight, go straight, straight to the to village. The village yeah. So this is the best money in a way that Indonesia right. can earn. Right. It's, it's helping the families on the ground. Right. Mostly spent on infrastructure, housing, uh, care, taking care of the family, education, education. and these yeah. things. So if you just come up with a suggestion, let's not let them go to the Middle East because it might be difficult over there, protect, uh. more than two billion US dollars will stop flowing into the villages. So one has to think about the consequences first. That's one thing. The other voices that come up in the protection of the migrant workers, noble causes again, say they need to be trained. Mm. They need to learn English Languages, or Arab yeah. or Chinese. They need to learn laws. They need to learn certain attitudes, cultural sensitivities, etc. Right now, a migrant worker wants to go abroad for the first time, has mm. to go through two months of training. Two months of training means two months no income. Yeah, who pays which for that? Which for a poor person, yeah. That's a very difficult uh, period to go through. Secondly, there will be charges. Right. Um, charges supposedly paid by the agency, but you can imagine yeah, that the, the agency, agency has ways to get it that. back from the workers. Sure. So here again, we need solutions. There are local governments who are now thinking to conduct the trainings themselves, hmm. not to give it to the agencies anymore. That could be a solution so the taxpayers pay for the training. Train. But still, the migrant workers don't earn money in two months time. So we have to measure the effectiveness. Right. If the English language course is so good that they really speak English, so be it. But if the evaluation shows they don't speak yeah. English, then why do it? Right. So we are suggesting, we are going to suggest, we're in the process of de developing this, we're going to suggest do a proper evaluation of those trainings and see where it can be improved, shortened, or changed in certain ways. Once method. we have that, we are going to suggest this to BNP Dua TKI, the right. government agency in charge, but also to the local governments. Because in many cases, the local governments are the ones making those decisions. Right. And well, when we talk about migrant, I'm, there's no end to it, the, the problems that, uh, that goes with it. But uh, back again to your, to your center for policies. Uh, again, you said the focus of the policies is actually economy. Yeah. Uh, I'm also curious as to why economy is, you know, you can talk for us, for, for, I don't know, you can take shares, equity, you can share monetary or whatever, but uh, 
this aspect of economy that you're looking at now is, can you define it? Which, which part of the economy are you looking at? Social economy, rather? Yeah, you could call it that. It's definitely the part of the economy that affects people most. Right. I think we need to, we, we're addressing policy makers. Right. So we're talking about which policies affect people the best and the worst way. So we are commenting and uh, analyzing and suggesting policies so you're basically areas that measuring people. policies. We're analyzing evaluating. them. We're evaluating them and seeing what impact they have on people. Right. A potato import uh, restriction. So what does it actually cause in right. the country? Right. So if I'm not, if, my, if I'm correct, you actually take cases, existing regulation, That's right. environments, and then you try to see whether this actually works and what can you do improve, to improve it? Yeah, you're absolutely right. This is right. actually, in a, you, you put it in a much better way than I could have done <laughs> it. Uh, the thing is indeed, if we analyze the entire environmental policy of Indonesia, right, we're right, ending right. up we with a book end. Yeah. and, yeah, exactly. right? But if we're talking about the land degradation in a particular area of Indonesia and how it's affected by other policies, by other things, we can make a specific recommendation what to change in order to have an have impact a, there that's okay. right we'll uh, return shortly uh, after the break please stay with us Welcome back. Uh, you're still watching Perspective, and we're still talking to Rainer Hofer from the Center for Indonesian Policy Studies. I got it. You right. got it. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, when you operate an organization, whatever the organization is, uh, you have manpower first of all. You have the co-founder, two persons, and then what else? We have. We are the co-founders. We have one person who. Well, we have the researchers. At the moment, they are right. associate researchers. Right. They're not staff. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then we have a person in charge of communications and we have a person in charge of fundraising um, who will help us, of course, to bring in the, the funds that the we cash. need for, the, right. for the operations. That's right. right. But there is an additional element that is particularly important to us. We are trying to be an open organization. That means we are bringing in interested people to join us in our right. projects. We want to be conducting what's called social research. That means if people have an interesting example, and I may use the opportunity of speaking here as well to call on people. Address them, address them. If, we have, <laughs> if you have interesting cases, if you have those projects that we mentioned earlier, right. where you think this policy does harm, it's got to be adjusted in a practical manner, come to us, tell us about it. We are interested in these kind of projects right. to do. We are also taking in volunteers who can help us when it comes to surveys. Right, right now we're interviewing migrant workers right. about those training programs. Right. What's your experience? We need help. Uh, we also need researchers to join us. Mm -hmm. We have universities in Indonesia that now increasingly teach public policy. Mm -hmm. Universitas uh, Pajajaran in Bandung or many others also have started public, public policy right. uh, classes. Those students are welcome to join us for an internship or volunteering or maybe as a co in a cooperation project. Right. Because these are the voices that we need in our social research that we want to do. And do you, get, do, you, do you think you can get, I don't know, I'm speaking from experience for example, do you think you can get access to that, to that pool of, it must be skill, it must be uh, something that has been trained, no? There's a certain lack of these skills in the country. Um, it has been addressed now. Also some funders from abroad have addressed it and right. say we need to develop this kind of think tank business in the right. country, policy advice business right. in the country. There is a good development at the moment, but some of them are partisan. Oh, okay. Some of them support individual politicians or a party. Right. Um, we are strictly non-partisan, that's right. important to us. Um, and some of them are also slightly more hierarchical. Right. We try to be really open. Right. So far, anybody who wrote to us was asked to join us to, to help us in the research. We're open to people to come right. and work with us on this. Right. There are many young people who are interested, skilled, and able to, to work on these projects. Right. Quite sure we can help them, train them. We will organize classes, how to write right. policy this proposals. This is what I'm interested in. Yeah. So you do train We well. will provide uh, classes on how to write a policy proposal. You don't start writing 50 pages <laughs> about the history 
Uh, can I join? <laughs> you don't. Sorry, I was. I, I, I just got you. Uh, you don't write about fifty pages history. The history of the problem, which an academic paper might do. Right. We are talking about pro productivity problems, maybe in the country. We're right. not talking about the history of productivity in Indonesia. Right. We'd start with a solution. Right. Okay. Then, in an executive summary, then we describe the background shortly, and then we come up with the explanation. To the point. To the point. <laughs> and to the point means the first point is what the politician reads. Right. The other points are read by his staff. This is also interesting. I mean, do do you teach them on how how this politician decision maker language is like? Absolutely. We have to, because you know, and there's a certain. I'll join too. You know, you're welcome <laughs> as a volunteer. <laughs> Can't afford you. <laughs> as a no, seriously, um, we need to make people understand that poli politicians are not just taking advantage right. of the people. Right. There are many of them who really intend to do something good for the country. Right. They need ammunition. Right. They need certain things, but if they only get academic papers, which is good, okay. but it doesn't really help. So right. that's what we're trying to do, and we're trying to teach this to interested and uh, young Whoever. people, mostly, who can acquire this kind of skill. How, how many subject or how many program, let's say, would you take at any one point? Depends on our staff. At the, at the beginning, now we can we can run a maximum of three projects right. at the same time. And how long do they usually last? Four to five months. Depend, months? Depending not on, even years? No, no. As I said, it's not an academic paper. Right. Uh, we're not going to sit in libraries much. We we talk to decision makers. We talk to the actually affected people, and we look at, interna at international experience. We have a wide network. Mm. We have a wide network of think tanks in the world that we can access. For the property so rights studies, I was able to write to my friends in Peru, in Niger, in Australia, New sure. Zealand. They give examples. They are willing to cooperate. Right. Once we have that, we distill the essence and we'll see what works for Indonesia and then we make our suggestion. Four to five months should be enough to come up with a paper that is about 10 pages long maximum. Right. Uh, so far you haven't finished any, any of those? No, we are in the no. process of finishing process. two, but not yet. What I'm interested is uh, in your, uh, in your, based on your experience, for example, uh, how is usually reception, you say that Politicians are actually open to advice? That's yes, I'm quite confident about that. I've yeah. spoken to many politicians in Indonesia, and um, those that really intend to work for their for country, the people, yeah. they really don't mind getting good ideas on how to do it. They come to join meetings, they sit for hours, even though they have a very busy schedule, mm -hmm. if they expect there's something coming out of this that they can use for their work. So as long as we have hands-on practical advice, we can do that. Migrant workers case, we're going to advise something on the training program, yeah. not on the entire right, 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 system right. of specific, specific recommendations yeah, yeah. that decision makers can handle. Okay, uh, thank you very much for your insight. My I, I you hope you enjoyed me. it because I enjoyed the discussion. Uh, so it was Rainer Heufer from the Center for Indonesian Policy Studies. And like he says, if you're interested to join or if you have projects, feel free. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. My pleasure. And see you in the next program. Bye-bye. Thank you.